Good morning. Welcome to Breakfast. You're watching with Charlie State and Nagat Manchetti. Our headlines today, the financial impact of Brexit. The government's official figures on how leaving the EU will affect the economy are published today. We'll be speaking to the Chancellor. Families failed, patients left in unsafe wards. Inspectors give England's worst performing mental health foundation just weeks to improve. More than 100 migrants have crossed the channel in small boats over the last three weeks alone. We'll be live on the Dover coast. Good morning. Ringing up a hefty bill, the telecoms regulator prepares to limit just how much people can be charged for calling directory inquiries. In sport, Jose Mourinho vents his frustration as Manchester United get a late winner to qualify for the knockout stages of the Champions League. And it may be much milder out there today, but not a great day to be on the move. We've got some heavy rain at times, especially this morning, and later on, widespread gales with severe gales in the north and the west. I'll have all the details here on Breakfast. Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 28th of November. Our top story today, the Treasury will publish its assessment today how the various scenarios for Brexit could affect the economy over the next 15 years. Officials have refused to comment on a newspaper report that the drop in economic output predicted in the analysis will be far bigger if there's no deal rather than Theresa May's Brexit plan. Our political correspondent Alex Forsyth is in Westminster for us this morning. Uh, Alex, very good morning to you. Uh, uh, there are lots of reasons why this could be a very important moment, not least of which is that uh, many people, aside from the principles of Brexit, are interested in the practicalities. Will things be more expensive? How will it affect them in their households? And maybe this is a step towards some of those answers. Yeah, we're expecting quite a lot of information that's going to be published today, not just the government analysis, but also the Bank of England are going to have something to say later on. But just focusing on that government publication for a moment, the plan is this. They're going to put out a range of different scenarios, and crucially, they'll be looking at uh, staying in the European Union, so our current relationship, compared to the deal that Mrs May has negotiated, compared to no deal at all. And we don't know what that's going to say, but I think it's pretty safe to assume that it's going to show that Mrs May's deal is better than leaving without a deal. Now that, I have no doubt, will prompt some to say this is project fear all over again. This is the government trying to scare people into supporting Mrs May's deal. We'll have to see what the figures say, but I think the government's going to push back quite hard on that and say that it's right that this kind of information is fed into the public debate. And I think they will hope it will help Mrs May's case because she is going to continue pushing her deal today. She went to Wales and Northern Ireland yesterday. Today she's going to be in Scotland talking about taking back control of our waters when it comes to fishing, talking about certainty for business. A few people are saying, why are you trying to convince the public when it's MPs you need to convince? Well, number 10, I think, are hoping that if the public gets on side, that might push some wavering MPs to back Mrs May. But quite right now, quite frankly, the numbers are still looking pretty tricky. This is going to be an uphill struggle for the Prime Minister. Alex, for the moment, thank you. Uh, just a reminder, we will be speaking to the Chancellor, Philip Hammond. That's coming up in just a few minutes' time. Understaffing and unsafe wards mean the Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust has been placed in special measures by inspectors for the third time in as many years. That makes it the UK's worst performing mental health trust and the Care Quality Commission says it has just weeks to make improvements to safety, as Nikki Fox reports. Just some of the families failed by England's worst performing mental health trust, many taking their lives before getting the help they needed. 19-year-old Niall Brown from Norfolk died in May. A popular BMXer, his family say they were denied crisis care and were told by staff to go private. He was speaking like a 14-year-old. Um, he could only feel the left side of his leg. Um, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on up there that wasn't right. Uh, he broke down in the shower that night, said, why am I going crazy? And we said, you're not going crazy, Niall. He couldn't hardly breathe, he couldn't hardly talk. And we were sent home with him. The inspection report says people are self harming while waiting for care, and the trust doesn't have a thread of safety running through it. It says thousands are waiting with no help, wards are unsafe, and there have been more deaths after failing to learn from mistakes. When people are in their, their hour of need, often extremely vulnerable, they need to have that confidence that those services are safe and of an appropriate quality. It, from this publication, it suggests that it's time for the Secretary of State to step in and take action. 
The trust says it's disappointed with the report's findings, but fully accepts them and is determined to get things right. Niall's father says he was told by staff they understand how he feels. He says that's impossible. Nikki Fox, BBC News. There are profound legal and ethical challenges to overcome before facial recognition technology can be regularly used in street policing. That's according to an independent report. The software identifies suspects by comparing police images with faces in crowds. The University of Cardiff noted that while it helped catch suspects, it wasn't always accurate. Here's our Home Affairs correspondent, Danny Shaw. Using computers to recognize faces. Artificial intelligence is now being used by police to identify suspects. But does it work? Cardiff University examined the use of facial recognition by South Wales Police at last year's Champions League final and at a series of other events including rugby internationals and pop concerts. Cameras scan thousands of spectators, comparing their features to images on a police database. It was part of a trial project funded by the Home Office. At the start, the system accurately matched only 3% of faces it picked out. That increased to 46% when a new computer algorithm became available, leading researchers to conclude that the technology can certainly assist police in spotting suspects who otherwise wouldn't be found. In the course of the trial, they recognised um, on a number of occasions that it could have other uses. For example, um, there were um, that there were uses of it to identify victims of, of, of crime as well when they were um, had been quite badly injured. Um, there are uses of it to identify missing people. And also the, the potentially we think there might be uses that could be put in place in terms of managing people with vulnerabilities such as Alzheimer's or have a tendency to go missing in order to be able to locate them in, for, for, for safeguarding reasons. But the researchers say facial recognition is not a silver bullet. The system struggled to work with large crowds and in poor light, while the face type of a small number of people triggered false positive results. Danny Shaw, BBC News. 22 people have been killed and 22 others injured in a series of explosions near a chemical factory in northern China. The fire engulfed 50 vehicles in all. Local government says it's investigating the cause of the incident. More than 100 scientists in China have signed a letter condemning claims made by a Chinese researcher that he helped create the world's first genetically edited babies. The scientist from the University of Shenzhen says he has successfully altered the DNA of twin girls to help them resist the HIV virus. He's been presenting findings to a conference in Hong Kong from where our China correspondent Robin Brandt sent this report. Dr. Her spent an hour inside there very calmly defending his work, but he was light on specifics, and that is problematic. He said that his work has been reviewed by several experts along the way, but he didn't give any details, no names. He said as well that Chinese law prevented him from giving the names of the parents of these two twins, Lulu and Nana. He couldn't say where they live either. He did say, intriguingly, that there is another pregnancy at the very early stages involving an embryo which his team has gene edited. So that is to come. There were lots of questions, of course. It felt to me kind of quietly hostile, questions about uh, funding, questions about his uh, secrecy. Uh, he said his manuscript detailing the work he's done uh, will be put on online for others to review. That is now the key question in this whole sensational uh, revelation. Will the details of what he's done be fully published? Will they be fully shared and fully available for others, others of his peers in this country, China and beyond to review and make their independent assessments? Robin Brandt reporting there. The time now is nine minutes past seven. So today we're going to get a report from the Treasury. The government's publishing its economic analysis. It's looking at the long-term effects of Brexit. That document will look at various scenarios expected to explore what might happen in the case of no deal. Chancellor Philip Hammond joins us now from Westminster. Very good morning to you, Mr Hammond. Thank good you morning. for your time this morning. Can I just ask you first, um, Theresa May, the Prime Minister, is obviously trying to persuade people that her deal is the only deal and the right way to go. How do you think her campaign to get people on side is going so far? Well, look, uh, the Prime Minister's deal has many critics. Uh, what we haven't heard, though, is a better plan. 
Uh, this is the only plan available for a negotiated exit from the European Union that will allow us to deliver Brexit in accordance with the referendum decision and protect our economy. And that's what we regard as our principal task. You saying and uh, reiterating Theresa May's message that it's the only plan doesn't make it a good plan. It's the best plan available. We've been given a clear instruction by the British people to exit the European Union. And what we've spent our time doing uh, is negotiating an exit that protects the British economy, protects people's jobs, protects British businesses, allows our uh, export businesses to carry on trading with the European Union so that we can carry on uh, seeing rising wages and rising living standards over the years to come. And I think that's what the British people uh, want. They want to leave the European Union, but they do not want to be made poorer in the process. They want our economy to be protected, and that's what this deal does. I suspect a lot of people listening to you this morning, Chancellor, given what you know and the studies you've done, and I know these reports, your own analysis is to be uh, published a little later on today, they might well be interested in some specifics. For example, food prices. Are they going to go up or down as a result of Theresa May's deal? Well, if we're able to deliver the deal that the Prime Minister has negotiated, we shouldn't see any uh, impact on food prices at all. There'll be no tariffs uh, on products coming in uh, to the UK. And both sides have made a commitment in this agreement that we reached on Sunday uh, to work to minimise any frictions uh, at the border. So we should see no material changes at all. And if there is no deal, if there is no deal, if I may, just on the food yeah. price issue, because sometimes it's helpful to be specific about things rather than talk about generalities. In the event of a no deal, the impact on food prices according to your own analysis. Well, if there is no, we, uh, uh, we haven't, um, uh, the, the figures that are going to be published later today don't go into the specifics of individual commodities, but other people, for example, some of the big um, supermarket chains, uh, have um, made statements already about what they uh, expect would happen to products that they import. But it's clear that if we had a no deal um, scenario, uh, that would uh, create impediments to trade. Uh, with the European Union and anything that creates impediments to trade will increase costs and prices. So it's absolutely clear that no deal would lead to higher food prices. Um, so you're looking at the generalities of the economy as I understand it in relation to these numbers. So can you honestly say that in Theresa May's deal the economy will be better than it is as we currently stand within the EU? Of the options available to deliver Brexit, to, to deliver on the commitment we've made to the British people to exit the European Union, uh, the deal which the Prime Minister has negotiated is the best one for the British economy. Better than uh, a straightforward free trade uh, agreement, even if that were available. Better than being uh, in the EEA. Certainly far better. Uh, than a no-deal exit. It remains implicit in what you're saying, and you're, I notice you're phrasing this very carefully, but it, may, it remains implicit in what you're saying that you think that remaining in the EU would be better for our economy. Well, if the only consideration, if the only consideration was the economy, uh, then uh, the analysis shows clearly that remaining in the European Union uh, would be a better outcome for the economy, but not by much. The Prime Minister's deal um, is, delivers an outcome that is very close to the economic um, if, if benefits of remaining in, while having all the political benefits of being out. And clearly, people don't only look at the economy, they also look uh, at the political and constitutional uh, benefits of uh, exiting the European Union. That was what drove uh, uh, the decision in the referendum vote. There's a lot of scaremongering going on at the moment about uh, what happens in the event of a no-deal Brexit. Uh, and you're amongst those talking uh, about how dreadful the, the economy could become and how difficult things could be for people. Why are you trying to scare people? I'm not trying to scare anybody, and I reject the term scaremongering. If the government wasn't doing anything about the possibility that we could leave the European Union in just four months' time, with no deal at all. If we weren't making any preparations, I'd be on this program and you'd rightly be attacking me for not preparing Britain for a possibility which clearly could happen. Uh, and in that case, 
Um, we know, for example, that there will be significant delays uh, at the channel ports because customs procedures will have to be um, introduced where they don't uh, exist now and that will slow down the flow of vehicles and therefore the flow of goods coming into Britain and going out of Britain. And of course we have to um, prepare for that. We have to make arrangements that will, as far as possible, minimise any disruption that will be caused by that no-deal exit. And the government's spending a lot of time and actually quite a lot of money uh, on preparing contingency plans, just as a government would do for any uh, possible uh, scenario that we thought was um, likely to possibly could happen. Uh, which would have a negative impact. We have to be prepared. If I may, can I just ask you a couple of personal questions uh, in relation to Brexit? Uh, sorry, I didn't mean that, that came out wrong, but you know what I mean. Uh, I'm, I'm so intrigued. I'm waiting. Your, your, your situation in relation uh, to the vote uh, on the 11th of December, supposing Theresa May loses that uh, vote and it's voted down, are you prepared to say here and now that you will remain member of her cabinet is, is that a guarantee? Well, look, you're, you're into hypothetical uh, well, territory Just like a straight here. answer, we're, really. We're, we're going to go out and we're going to sell uh, this deal. We're going to explain the benefits of the Prime Minister's uh, deal to the people of Britain. We're going to show them how it is the only way to deliver Brexit while also protecting our economy. And with, then we're going with respect, to appeal with respect, to Mr. Hammond, uh, I hate to put it. the national interest first. You know how I hate interrupting people, but uh, with respect, if anyone's listening to what you just said, they will only read that one way, which is you will not guarantee that you will quit the government if she Look, loses this vote. You, you are not prepared to give that guarantee this morning, which people will take to assume that you may well do that. Well, look, the, the Prime Minister has said herself that uh, if we don't get this vote through Parliament, we are in uncharted territory. There will be, uh, uh, we're, in, we're in an unknown world and we'll have to decide how to proceed. But we will sit down, if that were to happen, we will sit down as a cabinet and I will certainly uh, be there at the cabinet table. We will sit down as a cabinet and decide how best to proceed and what will guide us is what we believe is in the best interest of the nation. Philip Ham, thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you. Thank you. It's 17 minutes past seven. Time to talk to Matt, find out what's happening with the weather. Matt, it's quite miserable in lots of places today. It is. It's a grotty start to the day, Naga. Thank you very much. Good morning. Not a great start either. Not a great day to be on the move. In fact, got lots of surface water and spray around following some heavy overnight rain. More rain to come through the day and the winds are already picking up in the west. They will pick up further. Widespread gales, if not severe gales, developing later. If you're on the move, BBC Local Radio, best port of call for any potential travel disruption wherever you're heading. Now, out there at the moment, we've got one area of heavy rain clearing out. Patchy rain a drizzle coming and going across the rest of the country through this morning. So I can't guarantee you'll stay dry for the uh, morning commute. You're more likely to get a little bit damp at times. But heavy rain will return to Northern Ireland through the morning, early afternoon, and that prolonged rain will spread back into parts of Scotland too. Further south, we'll see the clouds break up a bit through the afternoon, so a greater chance of a little bit of sunshine, but still some heavy showers here. Not the temperatures, though. Double figures for all into the teens. You're not seeing that for the past week or so. So a much milder start out there. Well, that's one crumb of comfort on a wet and windy day. And as we finish the uh, afternoon, going to the evening, this is how the evening commute looks like. Could see winds 50, 60, maybe 70 miles an hour across the north and west of Scotland. Persistent rain on the southern highlands, the Grampians, the southern uplands, could cause some minor flooding. Worst of the day's rain, though, out the way from Northern Ireland. Could finish with some breaks in the cloud towards Fermanagh. And uh, whilst we'll see a few showers across England and Wales, some breaks in the cloud. Still pretty windy though. Winds scale force just about anywhere but around southern western coast. 50, 60 mile an hour gusts. Maybe a little bit more. Certainly possible. Now the winds will ease just a touch tonight. It's be going to be a breezy night. Rain eases off for a while but later on it returns across parts of England, Wales and by the end of the night into Northern Ireland. All helping to keep the temperatures up though. Milder by day, by night than it has been by day recently with some around 12 or 13 degrees. And that's because we've got warm air pushing northwards just ahead of this cold front here but it's ahead of that we're going to see another windy spell particularly for England and Wales tomorrow morning. So if you're on the move tomorrow morning's commute this is where we'll see the strongest of the winds. 40, 50, 60 mile hour gusts possible. Outbreaks of rain coming and going again through the morning. Heaviest in the west also affecting Northern Ireland and that will slide its way through the morning into the afternoon across parts of Scotland but it does mean 
Through the day, most will brighten up to sunshine and just a few heavy thundery showers in the west later. So perhaps a getting better kind of day for some of you on Thursday. Still on the mild side, but starting to feel a bit fresher compared with today. And that fresher feel continues into Friday. Winds coming from the North Atlantic around this swirl of uh, low pressure to the north of us, bringing a mixture of sunshine and showers. Great a chance, actually, of seeing some sunshine on Friday right across the UK. And into the weekend, there will be some sunshine. The outlooks here look fairly negative with rain in most places. And you'll notice that in your as well, but the rain will come and go through the weekend. There'll still be some drier moments to make the most of. Certainly not a washout, uh, Naga and Charlie. Back to you both. 13. Thanks very much, Matt. Uh, so, time now is 7.20. Ben, we like consumer stories that involve money and saving money. This is interesting. 118 call. How much does it cost? So, you would Im imagine what, you know, you ring director inquiries, you're on the call maybe, what, 90 seconds, something like that? I, I say, I thought about 45p. I know it's expensive, uh -uh. but I think, really? £11.23. No, be is quiet. The current one charge call. for one call. That's the current average of the most popular provider of it. You haven't it. got your decimal points mixed up there. No, £11.23. Uh, yes, yeah, staggering amount of money. But there is help because within the last few minutes, the telecoms regulator Ofcom, good morning by the way, uh, the telecoms regulator Ofcom has capped the price that director inquiries firms can actually charge for those 118 calls. It says it's now going to limit the cost of a call to £3.65 for the 90 second call. That compares, as we said, to the current astronomical price that the most popular provider, that's 118118, currently charges. They say that's a massive £11.23. Elsewhere, HMRC says there's been a 20% rise in scams demanding money over the phone and via email and text. They warn that the scams are getting increasingly sophisticated. Some messages, though, threaten legal action if the caller doesn't comply with the demand to transfer money. Well, HMRC has said that if you're in any doubt, just hang up and call them directly. And there could be a new TV streaming service to rival the likes of Netflix and Amazon Prime. Later today, the regulator is expected to back calls for public service broadcasters, including the BBC, ITV and Channel 4, to launch a combined service rather than their current existing platforms like iPlayer, ITV Hub and all four. Now, previous attempts to do that, they were blocked by the regulator. But it says that the market has now changed because of the arrival of new players that charge monthly subscriptions. Uh, you're up to date with the business. More from me just before eight. I'll see you then. Thanks very much, Ben. 7.22 the time. As winter approaches, charities are calling for more to be done to help the hundreds of thousands of people across the UK without a place to call home. Today, a campaign to end rough sleeping launches in London. Graham Satchel takes a look at what's being done both there and in Manchester to tackle this problem. She's not. Oh, she is. It's a bitterly cold night. Hello? We're homeless service, outreach. I'm just going to check you were right, darling. Hidden away in a back alley, a woman is sleeping rough in an abandoned cab. Are you getting help from anybody? How long have you been sleeping here for? Since February. February. Jamie and his team from London Street Rescue are trying to help the hard to reach. How old are you? 35. Okay. Disappointingly, I don't find it shocking anymore. She's got a relatively secure sleeping spot, which is an awful thing to hear yourself say. And that's giving her whatever sense of security she has at the minute. And, you know, to be able to work with her, we've got to try and break through that and see what we can do to help. The lady in the cab doesn't want immediate help, but Jamie will be back. London Street Rescue gets specific information about people sleeping rough from the police, the ambulance service and members of the public. They're just one part of a beefed up strategy to tackle rough sleeping this winter in London. But despite these efforts, homelessness has more than doubled since 2010. The numbers of homeless people are going up because the causes of homelessness are not being tackled. You can't solve a homelessness crisis without homes, for a start. The freeze on housing benefits and universal credit are tipping people over the edge and then just the cost of renting is increasing astronomically and much uh, faster than earnings so we're increasingly seeing people who are in work and also homeless i've met people sleeping rough who are working it's just living outside and you know in these weathers you could quite easily die in some some nights you normally know, I mean, it gets too cold we had no food me and the dog we were just hungry and freezing. A bit nasty, really, and we're living rough. 
Anthony lived in a tent in Manchester for eight months last year after breaking up with his partner. Manchester's winter scheme is called a bed every night and has already had some success, taking some 300 people off the street. Anthony was helped by shelter. A mapper, I can switch a light on when I want and it's not dark, you know what I mean? Instead of having a candle in the tent, trying to you know, burn myself out. Yeah, it's just brilliant. Where, where are you normally sleeping? Okay. Back in London, Jamie is trying to persuade another rough sleeper to get to a hostel with no luck. This is it. Okay, so there's someone sleeping in here. The government in Westminster says it's committed £100 million to end rough sleeping in England by 2027. But campaigners say despite the extra winter efforts, there is a sense here of treating the symptoms and not the cause. Graham Satchel, BBC News. In really interesting stories there. We're going to hear much more on this from the Mayor of Greater Manchester, Andy Burnham. He's going to join us just after 8 o'clock. You're watching Breakfast from BBC News. Still to come this morning, Watchdog has been continuing its investigations into food allergy labelling, looking at restaurants and coffee shops which are still getting it wrong. You'd be surprised. Time now to get the news, travel and weather where you are this morning. Good morning from BBC London News. I'm Charlotte Franks. We already know the number of murders in the capital this year is close to a 10-year high. But one South London borough has seen the number there fall significantly. Croydon had two murders in 2018, down from eight last year, and knife crime has also dropped significantly. One local activist said grassroots engagement and giving communities a voice is helping to prevent serious violence. Allow them to have their voice, speak their truth. That's what we've had in Croydon, and I'm proud to say I had a hand in establishing that. We've been consistent, and I think that speaks to a small amount to the success that we're having here in the reduction of our crime rate, because the, the, for, for once, the community feels it has a voice. The mother of a GB snowboarder who took her own life earlier this year says she hopes her daughter's legacy will be to raise awareness of mental health issues. Ellie Souter, who went to school in Surrey, died on her 18th birthday in July. Her parents have now received an outstanding achievement award on her behalf. It looked like she had it all, and she didn't have it all. She, you know, mentally, inside her head, she didn't have it all. So therefore, if other people feel the same way, they need to be able to talk about it. Charities are calling for more to be done to help the thousands of people in the capital without a home this winter. This year, City Hall will coordinate emergency shelters when temperatures drop below zero across all London boroughs. Previously, they were opened on a borough-by-borough borough basis. Right, let's have a look at the travel situation now. And there's a good service on all tube lines this morning. On the roads, on the A13, traffic is crawling into town, approaching the Goresbrook interchange at Dagenham. You can see it there. Westminster Bridge remains closed northbound between Lambeth Palace Road and Victoria Embankment. And Whitechapel High Street is closed eastbound between the junctions of Commercial Road and Whitechurch Lane. Right, let's have a quick look at the weather with Kate. Good morning. It's a mild start out there this morning, especially comparing it to the last few days. Temperatures mostly in double figures first thing. It is, however, rather damp. We've had outbreaks of rain overnight. Still more to come today. It's windy, but the temperature stays mild. Now, these outbreaks of rain will push through, turning lighter and patchier through the day. And the black discs are the wind gusts in miles per hour. We're looking at 40, maybe 45 miles per hour, even through central London. So a very windy day, but look at those temperatures up at 14 Celsius by the end of the afternoon. Now overnight the cloud remaining rain should clear out of the way. We'll see some clear spells and then it's a repeat performance. More cloud moving in and further spells of heavy rain. It stays pretty windy overnight as well and these are the minimum temperatures so not dropping down really too much at all between 10 and 12 Celsius. So a mild start again tomorrow. We'll have some outbreaks of rain in the morning but becoming dry. Still very windy tomorrow. We're looking at gusts of 40 maybe 50 miles per hour. I'm back with the latest from the BBC London newsroom in half an hour. Plenty more on our website at the usual address. Now, though, back to Charlie and Naga. Bye-bye for now.
Hello, welcome back to Breakfast with Charlie State and Naga Manchetti. Here's a summary of this morning's main stories from BBC News. The Chancellor has told this programme that remaining in the EU would be better for the UK on a purely economic basis. His comments come as the government will later publish its assessment of how the various possibilities for Brexit could affect the economy. Meanwhile, Theresa May is travelling to Scotland to argue the case for the deal that she's negotiated with Brussels. Well, if the only consideration, if the only consideration was the economy, uh, then uh, the analysis shows clearly that remaining in the European Union uh, would be a better outcome for the economy, but not by much. The Prime Minister's deal um, is, delivers an outcome that is very close to the economic um, if, if benefits of remaining in, while having all the political benefits of being out. Understaffing and unsafe wards mean the Norfolk and Suffolk NHS Foundation Trust has been placed in special measures by inspectors for the third time in as many years. That makes it the UK's worst performing mental health trust and the Care Quality Commission says it has just weeks to make improvements to safety. Trust says it accepts the findings and is determined to improve. The Department of Health says it's providing support to the trust. There are profound legal and ethical challenges to overcome before facial recognition technology can be regularly used in street policing. That's according to an independent report. The software identifies suspects by comparing police images with faces in crowds. Cardiff University noted that while it helped catch suspects, it wasn't always accurate. Now, many women who experience a traumatic birth are being let down by the NHS, and some are even being left with undiagnosed post-traumatic stress disorder. New research from the Royal College of Psychiatrists suggests as many as 1 in 25 women experience PTSD after childbirth. NHS England says it was improving mental health support for new mothers. More than 100 top scientists in China have signed a letter condemning claims made by a Chinese researcher that he helped create the world's first genetically edited babies. Scientists from the University of Shenzhen says he successfully altered the DNA of twin girls to help them resist the HIV virus. The Chinese government has ordered an immediate investigation into those claims. Scientists in Australia have begun the largest and most complicated coral regeneration project ever undertaken on the Great Barrier Reef. Researchers are collecting millions of coral eggs and sperm during the spectacular annual spawning event on the reef. It's the first step of an ambitious scheme that could help save dying coral reefs around the world. Now, if you're in fights, you might want to look away now. Let's show you what happened to Chris Gursky. Uh, he's on the left, taking off on a lovely hang gliding event. Well, it would have been lovely in this trip to Switzerland, apart from the fact that the instructor failed to attach the safety harness. So he got more than just gliding, it was more clinging on and a lot more heart in the mouth than he'd signed up for. Four minutes, four minutes he hung on, clung on to this. Look, they did manage to be navigated safely to a landing. There you go. And there you go. It sort of drops down to but the ground, doesn't it, the as they speed. get closer? That's the speed of it. That's how, how you that. land, rather than just being dumped in the bushes. But so he was just he was gripping okay. on the whole time. How do you forget to attach a safety harness to a person? That's well, kind of the basic yeah. thing, is it not? Is that... He did. He, he had to have some uh, some surgery. No, wow. uh, he had to go to hospital for for his wrist. He had some injury to his wrist just well, from the he's pure just strain. Clinging on in that Oof. wind. I wonder. How, yeah, I'd love to hear the conversation between them after that landing. Yeah. Anyway. But it's interesting, isn't it? Because cameras don't miss it. You see, all that's film now. Years ago, you wouldn't have seen that. Yeah. The cameras pick up everything. Yeah. Takes me to what happened last oh, night. Oh, cameras pick up everything. Yeah. Jose Mourinho. We've got a piece coming up for you about um, last night's game, both games. But actually, watch Jose Mourinho celebrate the goal. But also, watch Jose Mourinho react to a miss in the game, which is really oh. interesting. Lots of football managers don't like to kind of, I don't know, betray their players, I suppose. They don't want to, like, humiliate them. They, like, you know, very stern face during a match. Jose Mourinho, when he's disappointed, lets us all know. But it was good news for both Manchester sides. They're both through to the knockout stages of the Champions League. Look at this, though. That's Jose Mourinho. That's him celebrating their goal. You get an idea of how close Manchester United came to actually slipping up. Let's watch David Ornstein's VT now. 
Playing at the so-called Theatre of Dreams has become something of a nightmare for Manchester United this season. Against young boys, a fine chance to recapture their old habit of winning. Though Marcus Rashford quickly showcased United's more recent trend, failing to find the net. Manager Jose Mourinho, well, unimpressed. Young boys began to grow in belief and would have taken the lead if David De Gea hadn't intervened. That save proved all the more crucial when Marouane Fellaini struck in stoppage time to lift the gloom and cue some interesting celebrations. In Lyon, Manchester City fell behind to a breathtaking goal by Maxwell Cornet. The visitors responded well, however. Nothing was stopping this Emerick Laporte effort from levelling the scores. And although Cornet landed what looked to be the decisive blow, City had other ideas. Sergio Aguero securing a point and their passage to the last 16. David Ornstein, BBC News. And for those of you not familiar with the telly lingo, when I say VT, I mean videotape, clearly. Tonight then, both Tottenham and Liverpool have some work to do if they're to qualify for Spurs. It's quite simple, either beat Inter Milan or they go out of the competition. Got themselves in a spot of bother after failing to win any of their first three games. As for Liverpool, they'll qualify if they win in Paris and Red Star don't beat Napoli. Plenty for boss Jurgen Klopp to think about, but... A little bit distracted by the interpreter in his pre match press conference. Have a listen. It's a very erotic voice, by the way, the translator. <laughs> Congratulations. Wow. Again, like please. Whoops, <laughs> 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 Well, may I just say that um, I am very <laughs> pleased that he enjoyed my translation. <laughs> was, was it that? you? Sorry, what was that accent? Sally. Anyway. That was fun. Yeah, exactly. Um, he's a lovely man, Mr. He's Klopp. A, yeah, we, we like Jürgen, don't we? He's a bit of fun and quite relaxed ahead of what is an incredibly pressurised game. And to be clear, it was a French accent and that's ah. what Mr. Klopp was listening. It was the French, I wasn't it? Of French I thought it was sort of Mexican feel to it, but uh, easy. You should have done it because he was actually listening to a man. Oh, there you go, Charlie. So, I'll work on it, OK? Yeah, next time. <laughs> we'll look forward to that. Sol Campbell has his first job in management. The former England defender has been given the job at Macclesfield Town. They're bottom of the Football League. He's there to see them beat Exeter last night. He's previously complained that his managerial career has been hampered by a lack of opportunity for black coaches. England survived a fight back from Uganda to win the first of their three-match netball series. They had a nine-goal lead at half-time, but they let Uganda back into it. The scores were level in the final quarter, but England got themselves going again in Liverpool and won by 50 points to 46. There is a big fight for Tyson Fury this weekend. He challenges Deontay Wilder for the WBC heavyweight title in Los Angeles. Ahead of the fight, they both took time out of their training schedule to meet the fire teams who've been dealing with those horrendous wildfires over there. Fury took the opportunity to draw attention to another big problem in Los Angeles. There's a lot of homeless people on the streets here, more than I've ever seen ever in my life. You know, I'm, I'm staying in downtown LA, but if you go five minutes down the road, there's like, I don't know, thousands of homeless people. You think you might be in a third world country, but it's a crisis situation, something needs to be done about it. I know I'm just an outsider with an opinion, but it's a, uh, it's a situation that's happening all over the world, especially here in the UK as well. Before I go, how about this for a feat of incredible concentration? Two chess grandmasters have spent the entire month of November locked in stalemate. This is Norway's Magnus Carlsen and America's Fabiano Caruana. After 12 games and 12 draws, oh, he is awake. There we go. 12 draws. Tonight, they are heading into a series of fast paced tiebreakers called Armageddon Ooh. to decide who becomes world champion and min wins a million euros. I, I thought one of them was asleep then. No. I'd like to watch it. Yeah, you know love you chess, think. don't you? I really, really like chess. I think That's it's very possibly because you understand chess and I don't. But once you understand it, it's quite addictive. Is it? Mm. Thoughts? Oh, it's not for me. No. It's not for me. <laughs> Certainly not as a spectator sport. No. But, no, you know, I, there are plenty of people who do. That's why it's on. So, okay. you know, far be it from me. Tiddly winks later then, Charlie. Yes. No. It's more me. Uh, 7.39 is the time now. We'll have the web coming up for you a little bit later. Uh, how important is it to have clear and accurate food allergy labelling? You've heard recent cases recently, it's so important, and it's something that's been highlighted. Remember the case of Natasha Edna Laparus, who died after eating a baguette from Pressemanger. 
But a watchdog live investigation has also uncovered a number of other restaurants and coffee shops which are still getting it wrong. Presenter Matt Allwright is here with us now. Morning. 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 I mean, first thing to say is, after all the focus on this, you might think they've got it right. You would have thought so. Very high profile cases coming in. And, you know, we're talking about 10 allergy deaths every year. That's what we're looking at. So these are not small numbers. This is affecting people. And it's also affecting the way that people live their lives as well, where they can go and eat, where they feel safe to go and eat. And, you know, we are just scratching the, the, the surface of this story now. And we are discovering what a big difference it makes. Um, you know, we, we posed as customers with food allergies and went, we went to six of the big name family restaurants, Frank and Benny's, Pizza Hut's, Nando's, Pizza Express, Starbucks and Costa. And we were looking to get the correct information, just the basics, to, to know that in those big 14 allergen groups, to know that we were absolutely safe. Now, Pizza Express was the only uh, chain to give accurate advice in all five of the branches we visited. So you did five in each branch? Yeah, five, five in each, each branch, each 30 name. in yeah. total. And the others all let us down. To get an idea of what, the, what difference this makes, you just have to talk, as Steph did, to Frank and Matilda. They both have a nut allergy. Um, and they went to the chain Coast to Coast, which is owned by the same people as Frankie and Benny's. And they were given an agreement to sign which acknowledged that the restaurant couldn't guarantee that any dish was free from allergens. So they're sitting there so signing something effectively on an iPad saying that, you know, we can't guarantee you'll, you'll, you'll be safe in here. That's so the they, they'd identified themselves as pe people who had absolutely, allergies. Absolutely, absolutely. They put their hands up and said, listen, this is very important to us. Please give us the right information. And as this clip shows, you can only imagine how it feels. It's as though when you say you've got a nut allergy, you're there to almost be, be a problem to them and a problem to the restaurant. Let's be awkward. You're um, a paying customer. Yeah that's, yeah, that's the way that we see it. And it's a difficult scenario because we're not there to trip them up. Mm. We're there to enjoy a meal and then hopefully go home at the end of the night, yeah. um, not in an ambulance. You know, it's not too much to ask, is it, really? <laughs> Um, and as we were going around, you know, we were testing these, to give you an example, Frankie and Benny's, uh, our journalist asked about the presence of celery. Um, and uh, we were looking at a specific dish, Eggs Royale. The company's website says it contains celery. So we know from the website that's the case. But of course, it's not necessarily there on the menu. So you rely on staff to give you the correct information. Um, the server, you know, didn't pr consult the the product guide, and so this was the information that we got from them. Hi, I'm interested in the Eggs Royale, but I've got a celery allergy. Do you know if it's got um, any celery in that? Well, we don't have any in the kitchen anyway. Well, that's, that's frightening that the staff haven't been trained in that sense. I should say we've got the company, you have also been to the companies yeah. as well. Um, yeah. And just referring to Frankie and Benny's and Coast to Coast, Coast to Coast was the disclaimer or the, the thing that people were asked to sign. They have both said, the restaurant group which owns them has said, um, the allergy advice presented to the customers to read and tick is not a disclaimer and said that it does not ask guests to waive their rights. Yeah. So it was asked to sign something but not to waive their rights. It's just the feeling that you get. If you imagine you're taking your family out for dinner and you want to, the basics, as, as we heard there, not come home in an ambulance, yeah. not have to use an EpiPen, you're just asking for that information um, to be there at the, in the first instance on the menu so you can make a decision and feel safe together and go out together. Otherwise, people will stop eating out together. It's really in these chains' interest uh, which is the interesting thing. Um, another instance, Costa Coffee, our reporter asked for a mince pie and asked to make sure, um, you know, we knew it contained milk, but we asked the server whether it contained uh, milk. We were told, after consulting the allergy book, the server told us that it contained soya milk. Um, have a look at this, have a look at the clip. I've got a milk allergy, today's after they have milk in. It's so dangerous. Yeah, absolutely. This is the one that worries me most. Potentially, if you have an allergy, you're at risk now. 
So, you know, after this, I've asked tonight, you'll see, I, I'd speak to the FSA to ask how difficult is this really to get major restaurants who are making the same dishes, the same products every day, day in, day out, in their millions, just to put it on the label so people have confidence when they go in the first Matt, instance. Matt, just that the, on, on Starbucks, Costa, Frankie Benny's, Nando's, uh, all said that the incidents you've uncovered fell short of their usual standards, and they go on to say uh, they've addressed the issues with staff at a local and national level. Part of the problem is it looks like the staff are doing things wrong. They haven't been trained. I mean, you, you know, you if know, they're not trained or told a, a procedure to go through... It's really unfair on staff. This is another part of this. It's unfair on staff to take the responsibility for what could be a life or death situation, and they are being the people who are having to give this information. It should be there on the menu. It shouldn't be so difficult. Should also mention you mentioned Pizza Hut, and it's saying it's listened at least. It's now saying the information provided to you, the journalist was ultimately correct, it's saying, but it is still now taking steps to make allergy information clearer, introducing codes, QR codes on menu cards, and it's going to make, be making the writing, the text in its guide, bigger in the new, because there was confusion about how to read the guide amongst the staff as well. Yeah. So much in the programme tonight. I think lots of people are going to be fascinated and probably think twice at yeah, the moment before hopefully. they go to certain restaurants. Matt, thank you Thanks, so Matt. much. Thank you, guys. Uh, yes, to remind uh, the investigation uh, in the coffee shops is on Watchdog Live, BBC One tonight at eight o'clock. It's 14 minutes to eight. It is miserable outside. Matt, good morning to you. Where, tell me the sunshine's going to come up and all this horrible <laughs> rain and that horrible piercing rain that makes you just feel cold to your bones is going to go away. Some will see at least a little bit of sunshine today, Naga. Not many, though. Some will have to wait a little bit longer yet. Friday's probably looking the best day of the week as far as sunshine amounts are concerned. But as Naga has mentioned and hinted at, it's a bit of a grotty day out there this morning. Lots of rain overnight. It's left surface water and spray in the roads. Not a great day to be on the move. And the winds are set to pick up through today. We'll see widespread gales, if not severe gales, later. So if you are on the move, BBC Local Radio, best port of call, should there be any travel disruption where you're heading. Out there at the moment, though, we've got one batch of heavy rain going through and then just splatters of blue on the radar chart here, an indication that the rain is just going to come and go through the day. Most of it light and patchy for a time, but the deeper uh, blue colours here, an indication of some heavier rain pushing into the west once again. Showers further south, bit of sunshine in between, but more persistent rain later this morning, Northern Ireland and into the afternoon. That spreads across a good part of Scotland too. Note the temperatures. Now, it's actually milder out there this morning than it has been for some time and a mild day by and large. Temperatures into the teens for many this afternoon but of course that'll be tempered by the wind and the bre the, uh, the rain and the winds uh, as I said will strengthen as we go through the day into the evening rush I could see 60 70 mile hour gusts across the northern and western parts of Scotland persistent rain causing some minor flooding I suspect southern highlands Grampians into the southern uplands maybe the Lake District fells too but Drying off a little bit in Northern Ireland, even though for a seal sea winds 50, 60 mile an hour around the coast, as we will do across some western parts of England and Wales. But widespread gales, at least the further south you are, into the evening rush, a better chance of getting home dry. Will be a few showers, but also some clearer spells too. Tonight then, dries off for a while. Winds become a little less strong, but then pick up again through England and Wales later as rain returns. Rain by the end of the night back into Northern Ireland as well, we think. And uh, temperatures still holding up by night, higher than they have been by day of late. So a mild enough start to Thursday, but as this next weather system works its way northwards, ahead of this cold front here, we'll see the strongest winds, England and Wales. So this is where the strongest of the gusts will be to start your day tomorrow. England and Wales, southern western coast, 56 amount of gusts, gales elsewhere. Winds not as strong across Scotland and Northern Ireland, but still a breezy day nonetheless. Rain clears away from Northern Ireland quite quickly, pushes in across Scotland, so a wet morning, early afternoon here. But then, like most of us, we'll go into a state of sunshine and showers for the afternoon, so a better chance of seeing the sunshine through the second half of tomorrow. A few heavy showers in the west, and by and large still on the mild side. Cooler those who go through Thursday night and into Friday. Low pressure to the north, winds swirling anti-clockwise around it, bringing a mixture of sunshine and showers. As I've hinted at, better chance of some sunshine on Friday compared with what got over the next couple of days. Sunshine will be there this weekend at times at Naga and Charlie, but as the uh, outlook chart indicates, there will be a little bit of rain at times too, but not quite as windy as it will be today or indeed tomorrow. Back to both. Do you know what I wish I had at the moment? I'm going to go and look for one. A see-through umbrella. Because then, it, oh, then you can stay dry and see the sun, because it's all in and out, isn't it? It won't be in and out today. I think it'd be one we don't really want to see the grey skies, to be honest. But yeah, tomorrow, but you said maybe. sun's coming out tomorrow, so I'll have it. It will come it out tomorrow. tomorrow. 
Okay. Go on, get yourself Thanks, Matt. I think Christmas there are see-through umbrellas. I think there already are see-through umbrellas. I, said, I didn't say I'm going to invent one. I said I'm going to find one. Oh, find one. You can buy me one. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to the business news. Ben's got uh, now. This story is all, uh, all of us have been slightly amazed by this this morning. When you call one one eight one one eight, how much do you think you're paying? And everyone's saying, you know, forty p, maybe a pound, a couple of, uh, you know, you know, you're going to pay something. But the real figure is eleven pounds twenty three. Repeat that again. Eleven pounds twenty three pence for, for a ninety long? second call. Absolutely astonishing. Uh, and what the regulator said this morning is that has to end, uh, and so they've capped that. They're going to cap that at three pounds sixty-five for all providers of directory inquiries. I mean, I'm sort of, you know, amazed that many people still use these because there's so many other sources of mm. information. You know, on your smartphone, just Google the number or look for it online. But people still use them. People still being hit by that cost. Thanks very much. Yeah, morning to you. Over a million people still call directory services every year. Uh, and charges for calling those 118 numbers are something the regulator has been pretty concerned about for quite a while. Well, this morning it says it's going to limit the cost of a call to a maximum of £3.65 for those 90 seconds. That compares, as we said, to the staggering £11.23 that the most popular provider, that's 118118, currently charges. So let's speak to Jane Rumble, who is Director of Consumer Policy at Ofcom. Jane, good morning to you. Nice to see you. Uh, just to announce, uh, just to explain to us what you've announced this morning. I've sort of covered the headlines there, but you, you're angry at how much they're charging, and you say they can only charge £3.65. Yes, that's right. So in recent years, we've seen sharp price increases for some directory inquiry services. As you've pointed out, um, some services, such as the most popular one, 118 118, now charges over £11 for a 90 second call. Now, there are still some consumers today for whom these services really matter. It's important to them that they can get the number that they need when, when they need it. Um, this is around a million people, as you've just said. And what we've found out is that most people don't, just don't know how much these services cost today and so have received unexpectedly high bills. And in fact, some people have struggled to pay those bills. And so what we have announced today is that we are stepping in and taking firm action by introducing a price cap in order to protect consumers from high prices. And this will significantly reduce the cost of most calls. Yeah, most will welcome that cap today then. Um, but two things jump out at me from this. Why it's taken so long and why... 118118 was allowed to charge £11.23 for a 90 second call. How was that ever allowed in the first place? Well, um, I, I disagree that uh, it's taken us a long time um, this year. So we set out our plans in June this year. Um, we set out the evidence and our concerns. Um, we've weighed this up carefully. And today we've announced our decision that uh, we need to introduce a price cap to protect consumers from these high prices. Who is responsible for making it clear what these phone calls could cost? Well, um, when we last looked at this sector back in 2012, when there was little evidence of harm, uh, and prices um, since then have increased sharply, now we put in place back then a requirement that providers needed to include pricing when they advertise their service. But what has happened is that there's been little or no advertising, and yet prices have increased. Consumers just don't know how much some of these services cost. And as I said, they then receive an unexpectedly high bill, struggle to pay it. And so we are very concerned. So today we are introducing a price cap in order to protect consumers from these high prices. And this will significantly reduce the cost of these calls. Um, and 118118, to use your example, the most popular service is synonymous with this service. It advertises absolutely everywhere. We can certainly see now how it can afford to advertise everywhere. But why are you not making it more visible and advertising the alternatives? There are 400 providers of directory inquiries and there are some that are free. Why are you not advertising those and playing them at their own game and making people realise there are alternatives to calling these very expensive numbers? Um, well, the, the first thing to point out there is that while you may have seen adverts for 118, 118, they, they won't be for directory inquiry services. They're likely to be for other products that, and services that 118, 118 offers. So, but what can happen is that a viewer may see the number and be reminded of, of, of it um, on television and then call that number. So what we have decided to do is that we need to step in and introduce this cap in order to protect consumers so that they can call 
um, these numbers in the safe knowledge that they're protected from um, substantial high prices and um, can call these numbers in comfort. Jane, it's good to talk to you. Thanks very much. That's Jane Rumble there, Director of Consumer Policy at Ofcom, that this morning have imposed that cap. £3.65 is all you'll have to pay, rather than that staggering £11.23 charged by the most popular provider. Uh, more for me after eight. Still a lot, isn't it? Thanks, Ben. So do think about using other methods as well, like Ben said, internet, whatever, use your phone if you can. Uh, 7.55 now, uh, self-repairing concrete. If that existed, it would be a remarkable thing. So it's like that, and then it would pull itself together and be repaired. It's happening right now. Richard Westcott's got the details. Concrete is the second most used substance on Earth, a key ingredient in road building. Repairing the cracks can cause long delays. So what if you could build concrete that can fix itself. When there is a crack in concrete, this crack is going to open the matrix and then open uh, the capsule as well. Livia's helping to design tiny capsules the size of sand grains that will sit inside the concrete. Any crack will split them open, releasing a healing agent that fixes the crack. So they come along of the tube, they are collected in this solution, and here, this white material is where you can see thousands of microcapsules being produced and collected in this solution. Under the microscope, they look like little eggs. And here's one that's opened up inside some concrete. So effectively, you're trying to make like a little egg with a hard shell and an agent inside that will fix the concrete. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what, what's the hardest bit of that? Because you're making it at such a tiny scale, aren't you? Um, good question. The hardest big bit is about controlling the flow rates. So I can precisely control the size of this tiny shell that I'm doing, this tiny egg that I'm doing, and also control the shell thickness. The Cambridge team is working on other self-healing systems too. So this is inside the concrete, agent always pumping through. And then the minute a crack goes through the concrete, it will find one of these plastic tubes. The tube breaks, healing agent comes out, and it just seals the crack. And then you see it's only 